Evil in the Iron Woods, a derailed fantasy adventure by A.J. Pickett. Chapter 1. Port Clampot. The hardy rock fisher folk of Port Clampot eat out a living along the rocky coast, relying on the sea for almost everything they need. The village streets are paved with crushed shells, the locals' clothing is decorated with seabird feathers, and the air smells of salt water, dried fish, and old seaweed. However, the adventurers will quickly notice that no curious children are following them, nor are they playing in the village gardens or around the numerous lemon trees. The village docks comprise a third of the buildings, with many living in houses built on solid poles over the crashing waves and rocks below. The houses are mostly made of timber from the ironwood forest, which looms behind the town and stretches towards the distant mountains. Strangely, there is no lumber mill in the town or near the forest's edge, despite the evidence of all the carpentry. Adding to the intrigue, the mayor of Port Clampot is a former pirate named Skerig Onefoot. Although he has two feet, he was born without an arm, and is a fearsome expert with a heavy cutlass sword. Skerig has posted notices, seeking help to locate whoever is stealing the town's animals. From chickens to oxen to riding horses, the culprits remain unseen, but a generous reward is offered. More alarmingly, there are many pleas for help finding lost children, feared drowned or taken by someone or something in the Ironwood Forest. The villagers are on edge, and the adventurers may be their last hope. As the adventurers seek out things of interest in the town's few public buildings and the relatively poor wares on offer at the market, they will be approached by a local wise woman, who will tell them their fortune for free if they pledge their oath to help find the town's children. She also has something else she wants to talk about, but will only say a word about it if nobody from the town can hear it. She has a hut closer to the forest edge than most dare to dwell, but keeps a well-stocked market stall for selling wards and charms against the supernatural and the telling of fortunes. Her name is simply Maggie. She is a healer and knows things about Ironwood. Maggie has had a vision in which she saw the adventurer's arrival. She knows they will face danger in the oldest stones of the Ironwood, and must not eat nor drink anything from the Ironwood, or they will surely die. She has spent weeks preparing sacks of dried fish, seaweed, pickled lemons, and hard seed loaf, and offers these as proof of her foresight and payment for their help in ending whatever evil lies in the heart of Ironwood. Before the adventurers leave, she insists on giving them a special ward against the fairies of the wood. It's a couple of bags of knotted cord made of many different lengths of colourful string. All of the lengths of strings are different and no two knots are precisely the same. She says that hanging the wards off branches around them as they rest will protect them. Notes Skerig Onefoot has a widespread reputation all along the rocky coast. Many of the men of the little port are the former crew of his pirate ship, which was sunk in this cove so long ago the men all took wives and settled down to an honest living. The town sits on some well-concealed caves under the extensive docks, which the pirates still have a small fortune in. They hope to use wisely to ensure the port grows and thrives for their families. Skerrick is ostensibly in charge of the port town's affairs. Still, the protection of Port Clampot and their sole supply of lumber is Maggie, the druid of the Ironwood, who is on good terms with the forest elders. Spirits of the forest that inhabit ancient oak trees that they can move around in like they were flesh and blood giants. Maggie doesn't press her authority openly in the town, but a stern look and a few words in the ear of any man there, and the adventurers could quickly find themselves facing a mob of well-armed veteran pirates. Port Clampot doesn't do adventuring supplies, but they are good with fishing hooks, spears, swords, sacks, and rope. Chapter 2. The Bubbery Shrubbery After several hours walking through the forest, following game trails through the tangled undergrowth of the ironwood forest, the massive logs of fallen ironwood trees form bridges over whitewater rivers, cutting steep ravines through the broken hills the forest has grown over for eons. Between the towering trees grow six-foot-tall sword ferns with long, narrow fronds that form a lush carpet on the forest floor. There is huckleberry with edible berries on the small shrubs with their dark green glossy leaves and drifts of the red leaves of last fall, frozen over the winter just past. Clover-like leaves of sorrel and sprays of sudden pink and purple flowers as rhododendrons cling to slopes exposed to little more of the spring sunlight. 
Trillium wildflowers of light pink and white dance like fireflies over the waving, wide leaves in the morning breeze. The broad leaves of Salal conceal some more edible berries here and there. It can be like walking through a cathedral of wood in some parts, with the ironwood trees growing over 200 feet into the sky to form a canopy like a night sky of green, with stars made of sunlight breaking through the leaves and butterflies the size of birds darting among branches, crisscrossing like flying buttresses. Now and then, passing under these high-branching networks, it seems to rain clumps of moss and little showers of dew as creatures high overhead keep pace with the adventurers, staying out of sight, but letting out little chirps and warbles now and then. Very different from all the usual clatter of birds and insects, drakes, and the occasional flying cat. By noon, the adventurers come to an open meadow, a gorgeous spot in full sun, with only enough wind to fill the nose with all kinds of flower scents, and something deliciously and distinctly fruity. On a slight rise, surrounded by a riot of wildflowers, a neatly spaced clump of small shrubs with dark, glossy leaves grow, and they're almost groaning with little fruits that gleam as though each plant had been decorated with precious jewels. If that were not strange enough, some vines twist and wind around a tumble of ancient carved stones. The pea-green stems and broad leaves of these melons that rise right up into the air, kept aloft by bright orange and yellow melons that are somehow lighter than air. There are numerous enough to look like a beautiful display of balloons with green banners waving little green flags gently in the midday sunlight. Notes the small plants are magical bubbery shrubberies, native to the Fey realm. They are magic resistant and will only grow in the natural world if deliberately planted there by Fey creatures. The fruit is highly sought after both by Fey creatures and mortals who can find it, as it is highly addictive. As is the smoke of the dried, cured and burnt leaves, or the potent tea made from the shrub's thin, rainbow-coloured roots. Each small berry-like fruit has slightly different colour and is gelatinous, slightly sticky, and absolutely delicious. Each has a different effect on those who would eat one. Some are beneficial, such as increased energy and the ability to leap like a frog or run like a hare. Some confer immunity to insect stings, the scorch of fire, the bite of cold, or the corrosion of acid. Some will confer a bit of youth, or add a few wrinkles of age, change the shade of a person's hair, or make them speak another language for a while, or be able to be understood by anyone who listens to them talk. However, many can cause frightening hallucinations, reduce someone to a tiny size, shrink and grow limbs to random proportions, fill the bowels with brightly coloured gas, change the mood, and cause a deep slumber. All of the berries, though, with no exceptions, are exceptionally good at causing tooth decay, and an almost immediate, intense addiction to the fruit's incredible taste and smell. Speaking of tooth decay, the villains of this little scene lurk nearby, watching intently with nasty, beady little eyes. The tooth fairies, Nerishk, Hugh, Mugmonfk, and Wirgif, are watching everything, resting on top of some floating sun melons. Any adventurers who fall asleep who will become targets of their tooth extraction attacks. They come at the victim from different directions, using stealth then attack in a frenzy together, swarming around the victim's head and ripping the teeth out as quickly and as viciously as they can. If severely beaten, but not yet killed, they will cajole and whine like spoiled brats and complain that they were not left a proper gift by those who slept in their clearing. The correct offering to avoid their attack is a silver coin resting under your head when you sleep. As fey folk, they have no choice but to abide by this law. On the off chance that the adventurers manage to best the tooth fairies without harming them, they may be convinced to reveal the location of a nearby portal, a standing stone with a natural hole through the middle of it that leads through the Fey Realm a short way to another portal that emerges on a small island on the rocky coast, just a short walk at low tide through shallow water and a few hours climb and wander east to the town of Port Clampot, where they have collected quite a few teeth over the years, but lately only a few as all the children have gone missing, and no, they don't care where they went. Chapter 3. The Claw of the Pantacore The adventurers travel a few more hours into the ironwood forest. The trees are further apart, and there is more evidence that once long ago many were cut down, with the new growth not more than a hundred feet high. 
Thicker undergrowth thrives with more sunlight, but the game trails seem easier to find and very well travelled here. Large stones are more frequent, and many are shaped and carved, once standing in circles, or more and more, they were once part of buildings that must have been mighty indeed. Perhaps giants once lived here. Moving in some dense wood through a trail between a few thickets of scarlet thorns, it becomes eerily quiet all of a sudden. Not a chirp of a bird, shriek of a drake, or yowl of any other forest creature can be heard. Not so much as a peep from a bug. Just the sounds of the adventurer's cautious steps, the rustle of the ferns underfoot, and their heavy breathing. Something moves nearby. A thick branch of the thorn bush, or is it a vine of some kind? A very well disguised forest python perhaps? Whatever it is, it slithers out of sight almost the moment the movement can be seen. Suddenly, a warbling war cry splits the air from overhead and behind the adventurers, and something like a flight of arrows flashes by, thumping into the thorns very close to them. There is a sudden, deep, heart-stopping roar as the thorns come alive almost out of nowhere and move in a great hunting cat's unmistakably lean, powerful and deadly form. Its eyes flash with a glimmer of yellow light, and the pattern of its slick fur seems to shift and move, blending in perfectly with the forest's surroundings. It was no wonder nobody could see it. This is a fabled pantacore, and no sooner do you realise that than its wicked, thick and very long tail whips around, hurling a blast of claw-like thorns with enough force to shred any flesh they strike deeply into, releasing a terrible, pain-inducing poison that can cause muscles to spasm and locked into cramped immobility. Thankfully, the adventurers are not alone against this foe, as from the branches above, those who gave them a timely warning appear from their expert concealment, strange little forest folk covered in fur and brandishing wicked little metal-tipped javelins leap and swing into battle, ready to fight the monstrous cat to the death. Notes The Pantacore is a supernatural predator from the Fey Realm territory called the Everdark, the Forest of Shadows. It can change the patterns of its tan and green fur to become invisible while stalking prey within any forest. Much like a giant jaguar, it is heavily muscled and lives a solitary life, dragging its prey into the tree branches to consume. Unlike any natural big cat, its tail moves like a serpent and is covered in razor-sharp claws, which it can fire at prey by whipping its tail. The prehensile tail can even coil around a limb and pull someone off their feet, shredding them with those poison-tipped claws simultaneously. A cunning and deadly predator, the pantacore will not fight to the death, it won't like the fact that its hunt was spoiled, it's just interested in wounding someone quite severely in the hope that they will be weaker and slower to ambush later. The pantacore may retreat, but it will keep pursuing a hunt unless severely wounded. The little furred people are the Chewbarkers, native to the Ironwood. They are the enemies of both the debased trolls of the Stone Ruin lands and the many deadly creatures which have been attacking and killing them much too often of late. Thanks to some evil magic the trolls are no doubt responsible for. The Chewbarkers can understand a bit of sign language and tone of voice, but they don't understand people's speech. Instead, they have their own unique language and can draw pretty clear images with sticks and a bit of clear dirt on the ground. They live in tribes far up in the canopy of the ironwoods and thrive on a diet of fern shoots, fungus, insects and bird eggs. They can understand a bit of what bears say, but bears don't talk much. The Chewbarkers only travel into open areas in the forest, still they can provide a good drawing in the dirt or scratch into some bark of where the adventurers should go if they want to find where the trolls have been taking all the missing children. However, they will indicate that they have not yet to see this happening. They'll also indicate something about the grandfather trees leaving their part of the forest. Some tree giants, perhaps? They do their best to warn the adventurers not to eat anything in the forest that doesn't grow in good ways and will provide some basic supplies and tend to wounds using their woodland herbs without even being asked. They have no need of things from the lands of the townsfolk. The forest is their treasure and their home. Chapter 4. The Troll Ruins As they travel deeper into the forest, the adventurers come across the ruins of an ancient troll city. The ruins are overgrown with vines and moss, and many of the buildings have crumbled into piles of rubble. The air is thick with the scent of decay, and the adventurers must watch their step as they navigate the treacherous terrain. 
The ruins themselves are a maze of twisting streets and alleys, and it's clear that the trolls who once lived here were master builders. The buildings are made of sturdy stone and are adorned with intricate carvings and designs. However, it is clear the city was destroyed in a great battle, and the signs of violence are everywhere. Since it is unlikely any army brought siege engines into the forest, the many examples of pulverized rocks and large chipped and cracked out-of-place river stones point to this being a battle where mountain or cave giants must have made a real effort to totally destroy the troll city. As the adventurers make their way through the ruins, they come across signs of recent activity. There are footprints in the moss-covered mud and signs of movement among the rubble. It's clear that someone, or something, is lurking in the ruins. As the adventurers reach an area where some stone walls form a sheltering wall around a mostly clear, grassy area, they come across a group of animals who seem to be lost and frightened. There is a small goat, a large and scruffy looking cat with scars on her ears, a shaggy dog, a weary looking cow with a broken cowbell, and a rooster who is clucking nervously. The animals are all together in a way that is clearly not normal, and this is confirmed when the dog approaches them and starts to speak, asking them for help. At first, the animals act like they have been the victims of some terrible fate. They tell the adventurers that they were stolen from the nearby fishing village by evil fairies who made them eat strange food that has left them feeling confused and disorientated. They don't know where they are or how to get home, and they are afraid that they won't be welcome back in the village now that they have been tainted by the fairies' magic. They are very worried, as there are fearsome predators in the forest, and the troll city is not completely abandoned. There are trolls living in the ruins, and they are sure to, they are being hunted by them. The animals are not telling the full truth. To lure the adventurers into a false sense of security, they are pretending to be innocent victims of the Fae, but in reality, they have been twisted by the culinary magic of the great Grumbabub, a cauldron of sentient stew, and are serving the hag Morgwen by luring children out of the fishing village and leading them through the troll ruins to the twisted wood on the other side. Their friendly demeanor is just a ploy to get the adventurers to trust them and follow them deeper into the ruins and into the twisted wood, where they will alert the enemies who dwell there and then flee back to the ruins. As the adventurers get closer to the animals, they may notice something off about them. Perhaps their eyes are a little too bright, or their movements are a little too coordinated. It becomes clear that the animals are not quite themselves and that something is seriously wrong. If the adventurers question the animals or try to examine them more closely, they'll see that the animals actually hate them, as they hate all humans, thanks to the vile magic Grumbabub has inflicted them with. At this point, the animals will turn on the adventurers and attack, revealing their true evil nature. The goat may charge with its horns, the cat may scratch and bite, the dog may attempt to trip the adventurers, the cow may charge with its massive horns, and the rooster may peck and scratch with surprising ferocity. Notes. During the fight, the animals will spit insults and curses at the adventurers, and will accidentally let slip the name of Morgwen, the hag who was responsible for keeping Rumbabub fed with cooking ingredients and spreading its evil through the forest. But that is all they will reveal unless the adventurers manage to keep them talking, such as making the animals think they are doing far better in the fight than they really are. The adventurers must be prepared to fight back against the awakened animals if they hope to survive and continue their quest to stop Morgwen as the ruined city is still home to a few debased trolls who will come looking for the source of all the combat noise and attack immediately with feral, ravenous fury. To complicate matters, the animals are not aware that any adventurers wearing metal armor or carrying a lot of metal items, such as axes, swords, and pole arms, will attract the attention of some iron fleas who lurk in nearby ironwood saplings. These creatures look like dog-sized fleas, but they have acidic blood and feed on metal by regurgitating acid and slurping it back up. They are quite intent on feeding on as much metal as they can and attack by leaping around from trees to targets, spraying acid and tearing into flesh with their wood-gripping claws. The debased trolls are large, very stupid, but savage predators who will not only fight to the death, but heal wounds very quickly and can track prey by scent alone for many days. If you wish to introduce some more helpful allies in this part of the adventure, some friendly boulder folk may have taken up residence in the troll ruins, eating away at the old stone happily and minding their own business. They will not like the trolls, who attack them by hurling boulders at them and sometimes give them painful cracks. They will warn the adventurers about the iron fleas and that something in the ruins seems to have distracted the trolls quite a lot recently. 
Ending the enchantment on the animals will result in them returning to being ordinary animals again. But as they transform, they will vomit up a vile-smelling stew of rancid horse meat and bubbery berries. The cat, however, is not enchanted and has not eaten any of the stew. The cat's name is Pretipus, and she is a Grimalkin, the hag's familiar, keeping an eye on the transformed animals, which were her idea in the first place. Chapter 5 the Twisted Wood. As the adventurers continue deeper into the twisted wood of the ironwood forest, the air grows thick with mist and fog, created by the numerous waterfalls cascading down nearby rocky cliff sides that press in from all sides, forming a natural swampy valley. The ironwood start to give way for stands of ancient yew trees with smooth bark, dark and gnarled. The tree's poisonous berries hide clusters of brightly coloured tree frogs who make strange high-pitched calls to each other. A flash of black and white turns out to be a pair of curious raccoons who must have been scavenging through the fallen leaves, searching for tasty grubs and bugs. And there are plenty, with a long centipede, its legs an almost metallic red, snaking its way over a fallen log and vanishing under the peeling bark, festooned with a riot of different fungus varieties, all clustering over any decayed wood or bark that is not already growing some sort of moss or vine. Up above the trail, a horned owl hoots down at the group, as if warning them to turn back. The sound of creaking wood and rustling leaves takes over as a breeze from the nearby waterfall kicks up a gust. The trees seem to be shifting and moving as if alive, and soon the adventurers are confronted by a cluster of very large and unusual oak trees. Their bark is dark and twisted. They seem to have had the ground around them disturbed and eroded, or dug away from their thick roots. The branches of the trees are also a little too thick, and the canopy of leaves a little too sparse, and the shapes of the knots, burls, and hollows of the trunk are far too much like eyes and noses and lips to be mere coincidence. Around this glade of darkness, resting on rocks and roots, shoved into the ends of fallen wood shoved like posts in the ground, are many skulls. Quite a few of them are small. They are the remains of many children, all of them quite weathered and old bones, left out here for a long time. The breeze dies down, and not a sound can be heard. The insects, birds, and frogs are hushed, as though waiting. Before their eyes, a sound like distant mocking laughter can be heard, just above the creak and rustle of these ancient oak trees, starting to shift and move all of their own accord, and a figure seems to emerge out of the nearest tree, a clearly humanoid figure, shapely and extremely feminine. Just beyond this fey creature, an overgrown entrance to some lost shrine, temple, or dungeon can be seen, illuminated in the forest gloom by a strange green mist, almost luminous as it rises and wafts along the forest floor, as if creeping along like a living thing, snaking between the roots and the slimy toadstools. As the strange woman turns and looks at them, the intoxicating and otherworldly beauty of the supernatural woodland spirit, a fey being known as a dryad, stuns their minds with raw, boundless, fertile lust. It takes all their will just to tear their eyes and thoughts away from her, even for a moment, even if it could make the difference between life and death. The oaks rise up on their roots, and it is clear now these are not trees. They are tree giants, known as treants, and the adventurers are now in mortal danger. Notes the treants and dryads sense intruders in their territory move to attack the adventurers with a ferocity that belies their twisted appearance. The battle is fierce and intense, with the treants using their immense strength to hurl huge boulders and uproot trees to use as weapons, while the dryads use their speed and agility to dart in and out of the shadows, their long thorned claws tearing through the air. If the adventurers are successful in defeating the treants and dryads, they can enter the underground chamber and discover the source of the greenish glow, a pool of toxic sludge created by Morgwen's grumbabub stew. The pool seems to be pulsing with a sickly green light, and the adventurers can see that it is the source of the treants and dryads' corruption. The train is difficult in the twisted wood. The ground is slippery, overgrown, and has many vines that can easily trip an adventurer over. During the battle with the treants and the dryads, they will use the roots and branches of other plants to grab and entangle the adventurers, and to add a horrific twist, perhaps cause some skeletons of long-dead children to crawl up out of the ground and fight alongside them, as feeble, if very creepy, minions. 
there are stairs going down. Chapter 6. The Lair of Morgwen. The adventurers descend down the ancient winding stone steps, the dim light of their torches casting eerie shadows on the rough walls. As they approach the bottom, a step suddenly gives way, tumbling down and crashing into them, throwing them into the throne chamber below. The air is thick with a noxious mist of green, yellow and brown, carrying the scent of sewage, cooked horse meat, rendering bones and rotten fruit. The chamber is large and dark, with many shelves and benches along the walls, stocked with jars and urns, pots and wicked implements of butchery and torture. Various skulls, most of them mutated, and covered hunks of meat draped in rotten, wet sacks line the shelves. At the far end of the chamber, a massive throne carved of ironwood stands, flanked by two large iron cages that house the missing children of Port Clampot. The cages are still and silent, but the air is heavy with the foul magic that keeps them trapped. The throne has a large crystal ball resting on it, which displays the hideous image of the hag Morgwen within its glowing surface. In the centre of the chamber, a great sunken fire pit once roared with flames, but now contains only a smaller fire and stacks of ironwood, with a large iron cauldron babbling away in the heat. The cauldron seems to gleam with eldritch culinary power, resting on four iron feet and emitting foul mists that drift through the air like sinister apparitions. The sound of stirring can be heard, and a voice echoes through the chamber, taunting and teasing the adventurers in twisted little rhymes. The trap on the stairs has left them disorientated, and climbing back up the stairs seems a daunting task, with the heavy stone blocking their way. From the crystal ball, the voice of Morgwen rises suddenly and clearly, echoing around her lair. Through the woods and enemies unseen, over mud, moss, and stream, over rocks and broken towers, you have bested the guardians of my powers. Now here's my lair, a fearsome scene where many a mortal has ended their dreams. A nightmare, no, but another fine meat, cooked up into a right and tasty treat. Now here's my last, a nasty trick. Clad in iron and evil thick, a toxic brew on legs so fast, a mighty foe. Now, rub a bum, it's time to go. <laughs> yeah! At this, the large iron cauldron lifts up on four stout metal legs and starts to run around the center of the throne room. Its contents, rather than slop around wildly, seem to bob up and down, revealing a leering face composed of various bits of food, inset with actual boiled horse eyes and some long jagged teeth. As it runs around, it seems to burp and vomit splashes of eldritch energy that splatter over objects within the lair, bringing them to life. The perpetual stew known as Grumbabub also squirts the magical concoction over some of the wet sacks covering whatever stitched together meat the hag had concealed under the sacks. They twitch and shudder, making horrid, moist noises, and then come to life, with strange and twisted limbs, nonsensical arrangements of organs, eyes, and fang-filled jaws, all shrieking and jabbering incoherently. These were once creatures of the Fey Realm and the mortal world, now stitched together by the hag's wicked skills into depraved abominations that are filled with torment, confusion, and rage. It takes a few moments, but with a shriek of metal twisting and heavy thumps of ponderous steps, the large iron cages containing the missing children, now screaming in fright, come to life, moving as fast as they can to charge the adventurers and slam them into the chamber walls. This will be a fight that bards will sing about around tavern fires for many years to come, if anyone survives to tell the tale. Notes Morgwen the Hag is a feeble and sickly, hunched and wiry framed creature that seems like a very old woman, but in actual fact is not even slightly human. Standing upright, she towers over seven feet tall and has wicked talons on the ends of her fingers, no toes on her feet and a mouth full of sharp fangs. Her blood is an oozing echoer and she thrives on all things foul and evil. While she appears to have eyes, 
These are the dead eyes of one of your last victims inserted into their empty eye sockets, and her only means of vision is through magic. Mainly possessing forest creatures and her favourite, bloated corpse flies that buzz around her lair constantly. Though she appears weak, she is physically powerful, although she is no great match for a skilled, uh, well-armed warrior, and relies mainly on enchantment, concealment, curses, traps and minions to overcome any threat. At the first sign the adventurers have entered their lair, she uses the crystal ball on the far side of the throne room, sitting on the seat of the Fomorian throne, to conceal herself, appearing to teleport away and become an image of herself within the crystal ball. She will hope it convinces anyone that she's not actually inside the crystal ball, but far away, escaped through it to some other lair, and is now just taunting them and watching their doom. If the throne happens to be severely damaged, a massive fireball go off around the crystal ball, or it is attacked or dispelled directly, Morgan will be destroyed, and the crystal ball will shatter into a glittering cloud of fragments. Morgan is also trapped within that crystal ball for no less than nine minutes, after which time she cannot remain inside it, and is thrown out into the nearest unoccupied space. While inside the crystal ball, she can't cast spells, throw curses, and remains visible and audible the whole time. Grumbabub is a creature called a perpetual stew, created through ancient hag magic. The sentient concoction must be kept warm in order to survive, and is a master of brewing all sorts of potions, elixirs, poison, and enchanted food, as well as normal food. Grumbabub remains quiet and unmoving as the adventurers enter the lair, but leaps to wild action as soon as ordered to by Morgwen. Perpetual stew's alignments are determined by their ingredients, and Grumbabub has been fed with the meat of a murdered unicorn, so it is very evil and stocked with foul magic energy. In combat with the stew, it will spray mists of poison, globs of acidic ooze, and let loose scalding jets of steam. Plus, the iron cauldron body can inflict kick, slam, and scorch attacks in close combat. Grumbabub is quite capable of talking, and if somehow captured, it can be turned into a good aligned stew by adding nothing but fresh spring water wholesome ingredients and lots of love and kindness, though it will spit, rage and utter terrible curses the whole time. Overturning the iron cauldron will dump the stew out onto the ground, removing it from any heat, which will slowly kill the stew as it loses all its heat and vitality. Perpetual stews are highly valued by the stout little folk of the shires, who use them to create healing potions, elixirs and salves of wondrous usefulness, and are very careful about the ingredients they use. The iron cages holding the captured and miserable children are simply animated via magic and they have no other special qualities. They lumber around in direct lines, charging back and forth to try and crush enemies, but really, they can be mostly avoided and simply serve to keep the combat scene dynamic, with moving parts and shifting positions. The mutant abominations are assorted foul creatures, only interested in leaping at foes, then biting and shredding with their claws as much as possible before something ends their torment mercifully or not. During the fight, sneaking down the steps and into the lair is the hag's familiar, the Grimalkin cat, Pretipus. She will attempt to race across the chamber to the crystal ball and start to pull the velvet sack from under it and pull it over the crystal orb. The velvet sack is a bag of holding that can safely store the orb elsewhere, at which point Pretipus will grab the sack and run out of the lair as fast as she can, trying to escape with her mistress. Pretipus is knowledgeable on all the contents of the hag's lair, and if captured and severely threatened, will turn traitor and reveal much about the horrible details of this place. Feel free to add all sorts of noxious stuff that lines those walls. The lair of the hag Morgan is very dangerous. Hags are one of the most calculating, cruel, and devious supernatural monsters, and Morgan is ancient and well accomplished among her kind. She is responsible for the degradation and downfall of the troll civilization within the Ironwood, and now remains the only being to trade in the enchanted, evil hardwood of the Twisted Wood, which is found nowhere else. The carefully carved and enchanted timber is potent with ingrained malice, varnished with concentrated syrups of suffering, and sold in an otherworldly marketplace frequented by the wealthiest denizens of the infernal realms. It was Morgan who fashioned the Ironwood throne belonging to King of the Fomorian Giants, who ruled the Fey Realm's endless caverns of the Everdark. Morgan doesn't stay in her lair in the Twisted Wood all the time. She frequently makes use of a metallic tarnished door located in the wall behind the Ironwood throne. There is a sleeping chamber behind there, 
It's filled with bones and the skins of past victims like an evil nest. Morgan uses the magical Hexen key in that door's keyhole to open a portal to her shop in the otherworldly plane of Hades, where a massive sprawling marketplace for evil beings of all kinds is located. This dark merchant city is very dangerous, and Morgan's small shop, packed with charms, poisons and rare ironwood wands and staves she creates, and other creepy oddities, is guarded by a fearsome creature called an occult geist a haunting spirit made of the souls of cursed witches who died in a specific and very horrible way. Her shop is very securely locked by being behind an iron wall of some kind. How it is removed is a bit of a mystery. The Hexen Key has other locations it can unlock, depending on the specific type of door and lock it is used on. I will let you have fun with those. There is a large chest underneath the very heavy wooden throne, a magical item called a Trunk of Wanting. It may only be opened when a person is thinking about an item they really wish they had. That could fit comfortably in the large chest. When opened, the item will be inside the chest somehow, and will be quite real, at least for the next 13 hours, after which it will dissolve away into nothing. Any ordinary item will function normally. Precious metals will also be quite real. Gemstones will be very realistic fakes, and any magic item will seem like the real deal, but any magic it creates can be no better than a minor magical charm, such as a wizard's apprentice could perform. Eating any food or drink the chest produces will seem fine, but 13 hours later will cause excruciating pain, violent gastric distress and volatile, very thorough purging from all available orifices for at least 10 minutes. An unforgettable experience none would want to repeat. Morgwen's murder of a precious and pure unicorn to create all this foul magic is a terrible crime in the fairy realm, and the discovery of this by the adventurers will not go without their notice and their reward. So it may be that giant swans appear to give them a ride back over the ironwood, along with all the children, to the town of Clamport. <laughs>